morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Elliot Powell. Uh, I'm an associate professor in the Department of American Studies, I'm at, at, I'm, and I'm coming from the University of Minnesota. Um, I, I want to give another shout out to D'Angela, um, just in general, but really in particular, how well all of these papers, presentations really link up. Right? That takes a lot of skill. Uh, that takes some like some some track listing sequencing kind of deal, right? So like I just really want to say that I appreciate this because I'm like, what in, in part what I'm going to be talking about um, is actually tied to what Zach was talking about. So these things are very much sort of lining up. Uh, and in particular, what I'm going to be talking about is I'm going to be talking about what the Gen Z experience. I should say this. I'm going to back up. I'm not Gen Z. I am uh, unfortunately far too old to be Gen Z. Uh, but I teach a class uh, that deals with prints, that deals with pornography. And so my students are coming from, G they're, they're actually coming from Gen Z. Uh, and so the title of, of, of my class is Prints, Porn, and Public Space, uh, where they have to listen to and talk about the Vanity Six album, where they have to talk about Vanity Six. And so I'm going to be talking about that in terms of today. And I'm really going to illustrate how really sort of Gen Z finds and makes, and, and makes meaning of the album uh, and really the group, right, um, that came really sort of decades before this, this whole kind of generation uh, is born, has, has been born. So a little bit of background uh, about the class. Uh, I first taught the class in the 2015-2016, you know, academic year, uh, and I've taught it every year, if not every semester. Uh, I'm not teaching it this semester. I have a break from it. Um, but I, I basically teach it every year at Minnesota. Uh, and I'm lucky enough to have folks like Sahir and really D'Angela uh, and Miles and Anil to kind of sort of zoom in in terms of the class and, 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 and sort of give their own kind of expertise. Um, and for those who don't know, um, this is, I'm giving more background about the class. So Minneapolis has a particular kind of history within the 1980s. It's the first city uh, to have a city council pass an anti-porn law. Uh, they passed it in 1983. They passed it again in 1984. They had to pass it again because the mayor you know, vetoed it the first time. The mayor actually vetoed it the second time uh, as, as well. Um, and it had a kind of ripple effect. So after Minneapolis, the city council passes it, then you have other cities like Indianapolis are passing it. Uh, you have LA taking up the consideration of passing a similar kind of ordinance. Cambridge is doing the same thing. So sort of Suffolk County here uh, is, 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 very much, is, is very much also kind of building another anti-pornography case that's based off of Minneapolis, right? So again, this is happening in 83 and 84. We all, we all know what happens uh, in 84. Uh, with Purple Rain, right? And so Minneapolis takes uh, new spotlight in the early to mid, in, 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 sorry, it takes new spotlight within the early to mid 1980s, one around prints, of course, and then the other around pornography. And so the class is really about tracing these intersections of music and sex culture as they took place within Minneapolis. Um, and so throughout the course, we use Prince's music. We use all of the albums from the 1980s, uh, but we also look at Prince's own kind of associated acts. So we talk about Vanity Six, we talk about The Time, we talk about Jill Jones, uh, we talk about Sheila E., we talk about Apollonia Six, we talk about Sheena Easton, so on and so forth. Um, students also watch Purple Rain and Under the Cherry Moon and Sign of the Times. Uh, but importantly for the class, the Vanity Six album is their first album that they listen to. It's the first album that we actually discuss. In part, as really sort of Zachary has already mentioned, right? How we think about Vanity Six is so much tied to actually the discourses of porn and pornography. And so, for me at least, where I want to start the conversation and thinking about the intersections of music and sex culture within uh, a 1980s culture, within the culture of really Minneapolis, for me, I start with Vanity Six. So, what I want to kind of do is really go through a set of sort of thematics um, that, have, that have really sort of popped out throughout the course over the past seven to eight years. Some of this is going to be very text heavy, as you can see. Some of it is, is going to be a bit more bare. Uh, and I should say this about where uh, some of these quotes are coming from. Uh, they're, they're very much coming from the kinds of assignments that I offer in terms of the course. One is actually a listening journal where students write down um, their kind of immediate kind of reactions two songs, two albums. 
A second is actually an album review, right? Which is they've already listened to the album and now, right, it's more of a kind of reflection on it. Um, but we actually use uh, various kind of journalists and their own album reviews as models. Um, they, students also have an opportunity to write about these albums in their finals and in their midterms. But the two assignments where all students have to participate actually have to do about the listening journal and then the album kind of reflection, the album kind of review. Uh, and so I wanted to pull out various sets of themes that came out of these two sets of assignments. Uh, and by way of introduction, I think that we need to talk about, you know, we, we, we need to talk about the first song, right? We need to talk about Nasty Girl um, because it sets the tone, obviously, for the rest of the album. And one of the, the, the more prominent themes when students are writing about the Vanity Six album is they call it, you know, sort of refreshing. It's the most common response which for me was very surprising. I did not expect Gen Zers to listen to this album from 1982 and say, oh my God, this is so refreshing to hear, right? If it's not something that you would typically expect. But as you can see from these quotes that I've pulled, right, it shows the freedom of these women to know, you know, sort of what they want sexually. I love the female demand of a man to please her sexually, right? Uh, instead of waiting around and being passive, right? And the lyrics aren't subtle, and I love that about this song, right? It's very uh, obviously, you know, sort of direct here. Uh, and in this last quote, we we too we 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 uh, too often hear about men and women's sexual experiences as as really the guy being a little more selfish and not worrying about the girl's own kind of satisfaction, right? We have that as the reverse here, right? So really, so the first theme is really students are like, I love this album because it's so you know refreshing. The second most common, though, while they might find it refreshing, they also find it to be incredibly shocking, right? So I was not expecting it to be this graphic, right? In part, it's like, oh, this is really a kind of refreshing topic. And at the same time, they're like, oh, but this album from 1982, they weren't imagining it to be that explicit. This goes back to Aisha's presentation, going to the kind of 1920s, 1930s blues women, right? And you're like, well, I wasn't, I, you know, I, 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 I've listened to Shave and Dry before. It is a very shocking song. I do recommend going and listening to that because you're like, wow, you're really telling it. Like it, okay, go, <laughs> fine. Um, <laughs> So, you know, we have students being shocked and listening to Nasty Girl, right? Um, trying to give me something I can cream to it pops out a lot in the students' responses, right? It threw me off a little bit, right? And it makes me wonder what the reaction of white moms at the time are thinking when this song came out, right? So this goes back to also sort of Aisha's presentation and rock and roll and R&B, right? And the kinds of, of uh, tensions around race and sexuality that we see in, in the 1950s and 1960s. And then the third common response when students listen to Nasty Girl was actually about the word nasty. And they see it as an, as an important part of sort of reclaiming a word, reclaiming a particular word that, you know, has been used to really sort of denigrate women being nasty, right, being seen to be dirty. And here we have Vanity Six embracing the nastiness, right? So students are really catching on to this and they're reading into this and like, I really like this term nasty girl, right? And even another student was like thinking about the contemporary moment and, and thinking about Hillary Clinton and nasty women, right? That was Trump's kind of response to her, right? And saying, well, this is, a, this is an interesting kind of parallel. It's an interesting kind of sort of reclamation of that word. And I wanna use this reference to Hillary Clinton to, to kind of move to a second theme which is cultural references. Uh, how students are making meaning out of this album is really based in their own kind of position and own kind of knowledge, right? So the first common response, they know nothing about the 80s, but the first common response is jazzercise. Comes up a lot, right? Because that's what they listen to this album and they're like, this sounds like jazzercise, right? Jane Fonda workout vibes, right? That's where they're kind of listening to this and thinking, this is, this, is, this is their kind of, that's their only kind of touchstone here is thinking about jazzercise and these workout videos by, you know, sort of, you know, folks like Jane Fonda. Um, you know, another student's like, I would play this at, at a, you know, Back to the Future party, which is a very odd party to have in 2022, 2023. <laughs> Just not, a, but, you know, that was what the student uh, was, was thinking about. And then we have other 80s comparisons, right? Folks like Cindy Lauper and the B-52s and the Go-Go's. Uh, and then I had one student make a really interesting kind of connection between Nasty Girl and Janet Jackson's Nasty, right? 
uh, which obviously comes out later, but tied to the Minneapolis sound, right? And so this is a really, again, this is the first album that they're listening to. And so for me, as a professor in the class, it's like, wow, you're already making these kinds of connections, right? You're, always, you're, already, you're already doing some of the work for me. But, in, uh, but it, it, so moving from the 1980s, they also think about the contemporary period. And so there are lots of comparisons to folks like Nikki and Ariana Grande, Beyonce and very much, you know, Rihanna, right? And I, so I should say this, that they listen to Vanity Six before I do my lecture on Vanity Six, before we have a discussion of Vanity Six. Um, and so, as, as was already mentioned, you know, Beyonce has drawn on, you know, Nasty Girl multiple times, not only in Naughty Girl, right, but she also performs a variation of Naughty Girl that mixes, you know, Nasty Girl within her own set. So if anyone has seen Beyonce in concert, she's done this multiple times, right, showing these kind of intersections. Um, you know, I'm really taken to how, how, how one particular student talks about how a song like Makeup uh, makes her think about it's time to go out, and it makes her think about her freshman year in college, and now she's a senior, and she's like, I'm going to use this as my senior kind of going out, right? So a kind of, again, sort of contemporary example, we, not really contemporary for them, but thinking about TLC, which has popped up multiple times now, thinking about He's So Dull as being a precursor to No Scrubs, right? Which I thought was really, really interesting. And then we have comparisons to Twitter, right? Which is one of my favorite kind of responses, right? Listening to He's So Dull makes me think about Twitter, right? Which I never really thought about, but right, tweets of boys who are messaging girls and weirdly flirting with them. And then when they're turned down, the guys either ignore it or they lash out. And that was their kind of listening to He's So Dill, how they're making sense of this as Gen Zers, right? They're thinking about what are the kind of connections between this particular album in 1982 and my own position in whatever, 2020, 2021, so on and so forth. Social media becomes an important way that they're creating meaning through this, right? Um, they think about the bass and, you know, sort of don't hang up as being like Seinfeld, which was very left field for me. And then I listened to it and I was like, I know what you're talking about. At the first time I was like, what the hell is this? Um, and then we have a kind of hip hop comparison between makeup and, 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 and a kind of sort of stutter beat in sort of contemporary hip hop, which I also didn't, we didn't think about, but this is how they're kind of making sense of this, right? How they're kind of drawing these, these, these kind of connections. Um, and in some ways trying to, and, and this is uh, not intentional on their part, but to also show, I think, Prince's uh, pioneering practices within hip hop, right? If a, if a student is listening to Vanity Six and hearing hip hop, there's a way in which they're also articulating, making an argument for placing Prince within early hip hop in the 1980s, right? Which I think is a really, really fascinating thing for us to kind of think through. So a third kind of sort of thematic is around futurism or Afrofuturism. And for them, the two songs that drive me wild in makeup, those are the two songs that for, for them, for I think obvious reasons, are the more futuristic, right? So they're futuristic and robotic and extraterrestrial and intergalactic. Those are the common, common words that they use to talk about these songs. Um, but importantly, even when they're thinking about the kind of robotic futuristic sounds of these two songs, students are also drawing kinds of connections between that and the ballroom scene, the black queer ballroom scene, right? Which is another really fascinating thing to consider that I never thought of, but listening to makeup, a number of students, because of TV shows like Legendary and Pose, are thinking about what are these kind of connections between makeup and voguing, makeup and ballroom culture, right? And that puts, to go also to kind of Zachary's point, a kind of queer lens, a black queer lens, and listening practice to a Vanity Six album, right? Which we might not necessarily read as such, but students today are doing that work, right? So they're thinking and looking back at this, and they're also, again, making an argument about what, how this album might also be participating, extending within a ballroom culture of the 1980s that we see in films like Paris is Burning, right? So it's a really kind of brilliant analysis for me in reading this kind of work. Attached to that is really reading against the grain as well. So talking about a song like Makeup that seems very robotic, right? Uh, you know, Susan is very monotone. 
students are, again, this is their first album. We, we're probably week two, week three in the semester. It's really early. We haven't done any kind of critical reading of gender and sexuality studies, but they're doing this really fantastic analysis already. And they're thinking about Susan's monotone voice as, deal, as, as, as addressing the monotony of makeup and the monotony of conforming to, set, to, to certain kinds of norms around gender, right? And for me, a, a kind of brilliant analysis that I always get blown away when students are doing these kinds of assignments, right? The sound of the voice is almost, you know, like a robot, perhaps an allusion to beauty standards that ask women to conform to a very kind of look, right? The tone of Susan's voice does not seem happy, right? That that might actually think about addressing the kind of monotony around conformity uh, and how a song like Makeup might be a song of social critique, right? Which is something that I had never thought about prior to reading these students' responses, right? So this is also how I'm learning from my students, right? The drone of the tone is being a feeling of dread. Um, and so again, lastly, the kind of critique of makeup, the clothes that women wear, but not in a, in a shaming way. Rather, it questions the time and effort that women sometimes spend on getting ready or to impress men. The last line of the song, right? Smoke a cigarette, you know? And you know, so I'm not ready yet, right? A kind of demand that this man, like, you need to, like, hold off, right? because I'm still getting ready, right? A general kind of dis disdain of this whole process, right? So this is the kind of sort of um, reading practice and the kind of analysis that Gen Zers are doing within this, this class. And so I, I'm watching the time. I know I have about five minutes or a little less. Uh, and so I wanted to give these, these kind of snapshots of these themes from the students. Uh, but I also, I'm gonna end on two slides. Uh, about, because you might be curious, what are the students' uh, favorite and least favorite songs on this album? Which I know that sort of D'Angelo always loves that. So we're going to start with the least favorites. And I, I will say this, their least favorite and their favorite are always shocking to me. Because I'm almost the complete opposite. So we're going to start with least favorite. Their least favorite is if a girl answers, don't hang up, which crushes me, crushes me, because I'm like, that song is good, right? That song is funky, that song is hilarious, right? That is a fantastic, they see it, this is, Gen Zers are like, no, this is pitting women against each other, this is anti-feminist, and for them, the beginning of the album up until this song is all feminist. And then they get to this song and they're like, what the hell is this, right? <laughs> Two women fighting over a man, they get really mad about this. They get really passionate about this song and they're like, this is pitting women against each other. This is anti-feminist. This is not productive, right? They get really, and I'm like, it's not that deep, but they get really <laughs> upset, right? With this particular song, they get really confused because they're like, Prince took us, Vanity Six took us all this way on a feminist kind of journey, and then we get to this song, and I'm like, I don't, okay, fine, if that's how you're making, this is how they're making sense of it, right? Uh, and I want to kind of, uh, you know, embrace that and allow them to kind of have these, 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 these kind of critiques, right? That they're more interested in women sort of building each other up, right? And they see this song as women sort of tearing each other down. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'll also say this, there is some nuance here. There are some students who do like this song. There are some students who read it like I do. They see it more as actually a practice of playing the dozens, right? They see it as more of a kind of roasting activity, right? And they see Prince's own participation in that, right? And I think that's a really kind of, that's my reading on it. So like, I'm, I'm, I'm usually on their side on that one, but for the most part, the students do not like this song. Uh, my favorite kind of quote from a student is like, this is why I love being poly, right? <laughs> because I don't have to fight over anyone. And I was like, that's cool. Also very sort of Gen Z right now. And how, and how students are really kind of thinking about, you know, sort of, you know, monogamy and polyamory and various sets of relationships. And so this is how we kind of see that popping up. Now, uh, I will go to their most favorite. Um, you all might be even more shocked by this one because I, it, it still doesn't make sense to me. Um, three times two equals six is their most favorite, which is my least favorite on the album, 
It is not a song. I, that's not the I, I, I No, I don't really listen. I'm sorry. I don't, for those who are a fan of this, fine, be a fan. I, it's not a song that I really listen to. Students love this. Students love it for the exact uh, sort of opposite reason. Oh, sorry, it, it's, it's, they, they love it because of the reason that they hate, you know, you know the, the song about the, 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 the kind of so don't hang up, right? Because if they see it as that song is about pitting women against each other, they see three times two equals six about solidarity. And so for them, it, it just fully just brings it back to a kind of feminist kind of position for them, right? They, and they're really into the emotions of the song, right? They feel like I can connect to this. It's for them, that's, that's why they're kind of thinking about it. It reminds them of solidarity. They feel the emotion. Um, they love Vanity's voice and being so beautiful. The emotion again pops up. And then there's this last quote where I'm saying it's a genius way to end the album, right? It tells the group's story and embodies what the rest of the album kind of exudes. A girl best friend is her pride. Whether she's telling a man to drive her wild, right, in bed, or refusing to hang up the phone when the side chick answers, it's clear that these women are confident and unapologetic, right? That's how they're reading this. And it, for me, is always surprising because, again, I'm not the biggest fan of this song. But for them, the kind of solidarity that they wish they had and don't hang up reemerges in three times two equals six. And so I'll just end with this last quote from a student that I think really captures again how folks in Gen Z are really responding to Vanity Six in this album, right? Vanity Six laid the framework for making it acceptable for women to be openly sexual and exploring in their own kind of music and, 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 and with, with, with them, with, and, and being and, and exploring their own kind of musical endeavors. And for that, I am thankful. I think of some of the female artists that are popular today. Oop, there we go. And I think that Vanity Six made their careers possible, right? And so that goes back to again, even in the kind of contemporary moment when students listen to Vanity Six, they appreciate how Vanity Six has paved the way for so many artists that they love today. And so I will end there.